And we pick, I think, a few goodies from the last sprint. Some of you are aware of the project, some of you never heard about them, but this is not the complete overview, but maybe what has happened recently. So that is how I view this and I hope it will make sense for all of you. Just to be absolutely sure, is everything good for those online? You can hear and you can see the slides. Yes, of course. Very good. Excellent. Good. Thank you so much. Then we'll just start. So the first project is a project for which the member companies that have been around for a while typically refer to as the data project, the data driven project. It has been around for many, many years. It started out when all the software center companies were in a situation in which they had huge amounts of data and didn't have a clue on what to do with it. The huge amounts of data is still the same, but over the years we have seen a tremendous change in the use of this data. So it has become not so much how do we collect, how do we analyze, that those things are well in place since many years. It has become much more how do we make effective use of the data we collect. So this project works on these, uh, on that topic. And specifically, we work with something we call value design. So within a company where you have large, uh, very high number of feature teams doing features in parallel, working on different features, but also within the very same feature team, how do we get to align, agree on what we actually look to improve? What is that business level KPI that we as a team, in collaboration with many other teams, are striving to contribute to? So value design is all about how do we agree and align on what to optimize for. That we believe is key to be successful with any kind of data-driven or experimental uh, development approach. Because if you didn't agree up front what it was you were looking to approve, uh, optimize for and, and improve, you could never actually tell if an experiment is successful or not. So we have had situations where you run an experiment, you have maybe three or four or five or even more different valued factors or value drivers that people believe are important, but you never really decided on which one to optimize for. You run the experiment and you end up in a situation where you cannot really tell if you actually move the needle or not. So that's value design. It is all about is it a step by step technique that helps role and functions at different levels in a company align and ensure that R&D efforts uh, effectively contribute to the overall business goal. If we then just look at customer value and how we go and deliver value to customers, it used to be, and this is way back, the typical product generation. So the next version, the next generation of something was a little bit better than the previous one. Then we came more towards the, the software, talking about the software is more and, and more important, and the updates. So you could at least, in between the different generations, provide customers with added value just because of the software updates, and quite easily so. Then we have the DevOps, the data ops, the ML ops, the whole ops, which then refers to continuous practices. And I think for most companies, the DevOps is the most common and maybe most well established of these concepts. Where you work with continuous deployment, where you have R&D and operations in a continuous cycle. And the same is, of course, desired when we talk data and machine learning models. You would wish to continuously train, continuously deploy, continuously retrain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's, of course, added value in a much more frequent pace than ever before. A-B testing is another way where you can then compare version A and B. You decide if you know what you aim for, 
which version is the best, and then you deploy that one. And then most recently, the whole area of reinforcement learning has, of course, then lots of opportunities to increase uh, value delivery and shorten, decrease the cycles, which then this takes place within. But the question still remains, how do we know? And so how do we as a team decide what it is that we look to accomplish? And that's where value design comes into play. And we have been working with this for many years. We typically look at three different levels in a company. We have the teams, they have a number, their metrics and very many metrics. You have the product and the system level with their associated metrics. And then you have the top level KPIs, the business level KPIs. And there is, of course, a hierarchy where at the top you have a few and then the lower you go, the more the metrics. And you, I think, are well familiar. But there is this constant challenge of how do I make sure that as a team, I contribute to that top level KPI so that we don't go off and sub-optimize and have teams spending efforts on things that actually do not contribute to the overall business goal. Value design is a process. We use six steps that we have refined and tuned while working with the software center companies. What the process basically tells is that you can move from a qualitative understanding of customer value. And I think all companies here have a quite good understanding from talking to customers, maybe visiting customers. I mean, the, the qualitative feel we have of what the customers need. But what we would want as a complement is to also have more of a quantitative understanding, which basically means that we over time can measure that what we think add customer value is also true that it is appreciated. So the process helps teams define the value factors, prioritize, agree on them, and in the end, find the metrics of how to track them over time. And it's typically easy the first few steps, but when you then think of what are then the metrics, how do we actually measure this thing that we feel is important? then it becomes more tricky. But that's exactly what this project is about. And why would you even want to do this? Well, what we noticed is that if you have 10 people in the room, you, you have at least 10. 10. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. If you have 10 people in the room, you have often twice as many opinions, ideas on what adds value. So we have great examples from, from company workshops where people enter the room and they seem to agree and everyone is happy. And then the longer we go, and I mean, this sounds awful, but it is actually really <laughs> helpful. But the longer we run the workshop, the more people disagree because you realize that we, 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 we think we mean the same thing, but we are so far apart. And in the Swedish, everyone needs to agree culture, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but it is really helpful. And many teams tell us that only to get to know the different implicit assumptions is actually quite helpful. And then again, I told you how we do this. So we run the, the process of um, identifying, prioritizing, merging these value factors. And I will show you some examples. You can, of course, run value design applying different scopes. You can do it on a feature. You can do it on a system, on a product, uh, even at a company level. I mean, the higher up you go, typically, the more difficult it gets. What we notice, and I will come back to this, we have been spending most of our time on the feature level. But that is also slightly changing now with the whole digital services experience that we have. So now we have teams or companies interested in value design, but much more on the end-to-end -end service development, which is a little bit different. 
it's more of the user experience in an end-to-end -end service context rather than a team developing a very specific feature. So that is something added to this picture, I would say. You could also, and this is just to show a little bit more on the, the scope, the focus, you could of course do it on a product level where you look to uh, see, for example, what is the effect if I add this new feature or functionality to the product? You would want to really know that in beforehand so that you can then after measure if that was actually true. You could run it on a process. So did we achieve the process improvements that we were looking to achieve? You can run it on a customer level where many companies nowadays experience a situation where they monetize based on how well they fulfill the customer KPIs. So then you really need to understand your customer and if what you deliver actually fulfills their main goal. And then you can run it on an ecosystem level even um, to find out whether or not your ecosystem partners are delivering on the purpose for which you engage with them, the reasons for the engagement basically. And as you look to reposition yourself, you also would want to know how to make that repositioning happening. So it, it can be used on very many different levels, but as I said, so far we have mainly been working with teams in R&D on features. This is an example from one of the companies and I have showed this many times. So for some of you, this is a repetition, but still it is valid. This is, um, if I am not mistaken, this is adaptive cruise control and this is one for cars. And only to visualize, I mean, we basically ran out of whiteboard space when asking the same team who has been working with the feature for many years, what is the key value factor? And we got all of these different answers. And then you realize if you don't agree, it is pretty difficult to have an effective team working on, on, on value here. But so we worked with them and, and you reach an agreement and you can start prioritize. You can start what you want the specific value factor to increase or decrease if you run an experiment. So you get a feel for the different value factors and how they affect this specific feature. I have a slide from, and, and this is just parts of the work we did, but this is from another company. This is actually Jefferson, and I think you realize because it says crew, um, they do, they have an app, they do crew planning for uh, the flight industry, logistics systems for the flight industry. So crew happiness here is uh, crew on flights, on, on airplanes. Um, they can bid for their schedule, for the trips, the flights they want to take or not to take. So these are all factors that they felt were important. So they brought them to the table, we agreed on one, and then we tried to break it down to see what it actually meant. If perceived value is important, you, you, as a user, you have a perceived value of something. What does that actually mean? What it, does it consist of? At Grundfos, we actually had a similar workshop with a team where they said, well, we offer peace of mind. So what does peace of mind mean? And we had a long discussion because how do you measure peace of mind? And so that's what this is all about. And I think it goes for many of the companies here. There is this huge big thing like customer satisfaction, but what does it mean and how can you measure it? So that's what we do here. And we have many examples on value factors, working with companies with all of these mentioned on the slide here to really look into how do we break it down to something measurable. Here again is Jefferson, where maybe you can have a look at the one saying value function, where we with one team reached a state where we basically had a formula, you could say, where they had put a weight on every single value factor, which means that you at least conceptually can think of how do I quantitatively measure this over time? And of course, it is never optimal, 
but you get to at least prioritize. Everything cannot be equally important. And that's the main thing here. This is an example where we worked with the team on how do the team and feature level metrics then correspond and align and contribute to revenue. This is uh, uh, another company where we had other, yeah, this is telecom, as you can tell, how do these align? And very many of these. And if I then look back at this uh, recent sprint, we spent a lot of time here in the process going from qualitative to quantitative to try to make it simple, to try to have teams share every single value factor they could think of and to then try to find metrics for each of those. That is a key, I would say, step in, in this whole thing. Then what we noticed, so these are, I could maybe call them emerging. We did some work, but not that much. But all of a sudden, and this didn't happen in previous sprints, but we had quite many UX teams reaching out to us sharing the experience of difficulties to translate UX value to more of a business language or business value. How do what the UX team do, does, contribute to the overall business goal? So it happened this spring that they wanted us to help them work our way through what would a more data-driven UX process look like and how can we as a UX team translate what we do so that the business people understand the value. And that is again, they are part of all the teams. You have the business KPIs on the top and they experience a situation where they come not completely misaligned, but at least they were not able to communicate with each other. So that was quite interesting. So we started this work with them. And just um, to summarize maybe what we did so far, but in the workshops we had, they were very exploratory. We started out by identifying what are the business KPIs that are actually then influenced by UX work. And how could we over time quantify what the UX teams do so that these business people understand progress. That has been the main. Uh, otherwise, I mean, it is within the same scope as our previous work, but still a little bit different because of what the UX teams are involved in. And then, as I mentioned in the beginning, we spent quite a lot of time also with companies developing now digital services, which I mean, they are all 17 software center companies are in that space. We worked with a few to help them understand better with the recurring revenue streams, with the more continuous practices. How do we understand value over time? Is, do we need to think about these things differently? The features, the services we developed over time in a more service-oriented um, business model, how can we identify value of those services? Um, so the discussion was a little bit um, yeah, different, you could say. One of the concrete things we worked on, and that is the third section here, Many of the companies experience the situation in which when top management tells us that we should increase service revenue, we end up in a situation where everyone everywhere in the company comes up with an idea. And there are lots of ideas, I mean, good ideas everywhere. But how do we prioritize these ideas? How do we help each other understand where to put the efforts? So then value design became a tool or technique for that discussion as well. So you, I hope you see that it can take very many different shapes. And that is exactly what we are exploring within this project. 
This is a small picture on a big slide. I apologize, but maybe some of you have seen it before and it is not mine, it is not you, it is from Gartner in 2016. But what it says, it combines ideas from design thinking and design thinking is very user centric, which is maybe not the traditional method applied in the software centric companies but something that is increasingly important when you develop services, everyone is talking about we need to get more user centric. So then design thinking becomes important. You have ideas from Lean Startup. And we listen, for those of you who listened to Fredrik Hulgusson this morning, when he talked about the importance of an MVP, we, we cannot afford to develop the big chunks and then realize we failed. No, we need to adopt a much more lean way of working. And then in the end, of course, we have the agile. So many of the software center companies now find themselves in a situation where they combine these three. They want the design thinking, they want the lean startup thinking, and they want it to take place within the sprints, the agile sprints. And this is something that all the service development teams that we interacted with experience. They do exactly this. And then the reward of value design was to, within that process, help them facilitate how to prioritize ideas and what to validate with customers. That was uh, how we worked with them. So value design here, help them scope ideas and identifying the criteria for an MVP. And then again, it can hopefully, I mean, we only started this, but the hope is that value design can help them reason about the whole process from problem <coughs> identification and solving to also executing and, and deploying that solution to customers. But it was quite an interesting discussion to have with the companies experiencing a situation where you drown in ideas, you want to validate with customers, but you really need to prioritize and you do not always know the criteria for what piece, what slice, what little MVP is the most important one to, to validate. So that's where we are right now and that's the discussion we have had. Um, for those of you who are interested, there are papers on the topic and I can also share them with you. We have them in the sprint proposal as well. And then the idea in this session is also to give you a little bit of a feel for what will happen next. And next is Sprint 23, believe it or not. Um, <clears throat> what I just presented, and even if it is a work that has been going on for many years, value design is far from trivial. It is still really difficult. And we believe, or at least what hypothesis is, value design is outcome oriented. You focus on what is it that we look to achieve? Many of the companies, they are still requirements driven. Mm -hmm. And requirements driven and outcome oriented are two very different things. And even if there are people, roles, teams, opportunities for the outcome driven mindset, the organization is typically requirements driven built. It is built and organized around for building requirements. So what we propose and what we would be interested in exploring in the next sprint is to work with teams, pick a requirement and work our ways backwards to help them understand what it is they look to achieve, but we start in the requirement. We didn't really do that. It is similar to what we did. But so far, we didn't even want the requirement. We just picked the feature. So this is a little bit going back to then reach maybe the situation where they would want to be. But it aligns, I think, more with the mindset of many of the teams. 
So what is it that we look to accomplish? And how do we know that we achieved the outcome that was implicitly intended by the requirements? It's a little bit of a twist on how we so far work with value design that we hope will make it easier and that we would want to explore with the user. Mm -hmm. And then what we aim to provide is typically more on the conceptual. So we, we do frameworks, we do models, we have best practices, case examples that we can share within the companies. We, for many years ago, had a workshop, a reporting workshop, where, where one of the teams we had worked with on value design came and told a story on how they had been working with this internally. So that's the kind of knowledge that we produce. How it can be effectively used to support development and then with different kinds of functions, different teams in, in a company. But then again, as the overall um, Sprint 23 goal, we would look to how to translate requirements into outcomes and how to help teams within these large organizations effectively adopt value design as a mechanism to improve alignment between different levels. Mm -hmm. Two people in the project. So for anyone who would be interested, feel free to reach out. I will stop here if there at this point is there any questions? I have a question. I was just curious regarding the results of Sprint 22. Did you have it? Have you done some kind of comparison between a traditional way of working and a model with value design? In in some well, in some terms, it's in speed, in time, in cost, or whatever parameter. The end, so if we have not not really in terms of speed or quality, we haven't measured that. Mm -hmm. What I could say, I think it is valid as a comparison. Mm -hmm. We have over the years worked quite closely with one team in one of the companies. They struggled a lot in the beginning because this was not really the the ways of working. They told us that now, when they have been working like this, even if it is within only one team, they experienced that their own approach to product management had changed quite dramatically. It used to be, and this is me using their words, it used to be product management giving them requirements and asking them to build it. And now they felt that everyone in the team could approach product management and then instead ask them, what is it that you look to achieve? And so that to me counts as a measurement of a mindset change, even sure. though I cannot put a number on it. No. But they experience it as something quite positive. Mm. Um, so there is something there, because what I hope is that when you can ask that question, you also know what not to build. Mm -hmm. And over time, that to me would mean that effectiveness increase, maybe even speed. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds like it. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the quality, for sure. If you could get rid of the discussions regarding it. Uh, and exact requirements and instead having uh, a, a discussion on the next level regarding mm. actual value to be created mm. that of course is much it's a, it's a problem. Mm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. I was thinking uh, what about the technical depth and uh, solving that in the team how does that uh, come into this have you thought anything about that so so typically when you build something out of a business value it's very difficult for the business to see the value in building a, um, a scalable platform or mm -hmm. doing something in a way where we don't need to come back to it in a year. 
<clears throat> have you had any thoughts on that? Um, how how that can be? Can that be a value also? Can we put numbers on that uh, as well? Or how do we get business to interact with that part? Yes, I mean, that is a really good question. We haven't really been in that space. We have picked very distinct features yeah. because this is difficult already. So companies typically pick the lowest hanging yeah, fruit. Yeah. So not really, but I mean, you would really want to be able yeah, to do that, yeah, right? Yeah. But we haven't yet. No. We have really stayed within the feature for Maybe 25. No, but <laughs> I do see that the scope is changing. And yeah. that's why I found it quite interesting the UX teams reaching out, the service innovation yeah. teams reaching out. I mean, we had you talk about platforms this morning. I mean, there is a lot of change going on. And, and, and I can see the scope of this change. Features are, of course, still very important. Yeah. They will always be. Yeah. But the teams within the companies also look different now. So maybe, I mean, uh, ask me in a two or three <laughs>